I would you believe it, we've only just got started and we're already on our way to an extended special, Calling All Engines. Since I will be moving for the summer, that review won't be out for a while, but I promise I won't leave you guys waiting too long. I'm back! Two thousand and five, the Diamond Jubilee anniversary of the Railway series, sixty whole years of the book series, and twenty-one years since the beginning of the TV series. And the celebrations were a shit show. There was a terribly organised anniversary party in Hertfordshire, where the only thing Thomas related was a cardboard cutout. And there was a big brouhaha involving the Railway series as Christopher Audrey was holding a petition to make his books easier to access. On top of the poor reception towards their rebrand of the TV show with Series 8, the pressure was on for Hit Entertainment to really give it their all to celebrate the anniversary with a bang. It was decided that their celebratory event would be a feature-length special of Thomas and Friends. The end result is what we're going to be looking at today, Calling All Engines. The special was written by longtime member of the writing staff, Paul Larson, the guy who wrote some of my favourite episodes from the previous series. Uh, absolutely no sarcasm whatsoever, but hey, he also wrote some good episodes at least. It also had some writing assistance from Mark Seal, whose contributions I'll talk about later. It was once again directed by Stephen Asquith, produced by Simon Spencer, and composed by Robert Hartshorn, with Ed Welch stepping in as usual to provide sing-along songs. This special was released on September 3rd in the US and October 3rd in the UK. The very first time that America would see a Thomas & Friends production before the United Kingdom, under their first feature-length production released straight to DVD and VHS. There was also a one-week cinema event for this special in Germany, but without spoiling anything, did this thing really need a cinematic release? There's barely anything on a bigger than normal scale in this production. One thing that confuses me the most is that this is meant to take place between Series 8 and Series 9, but by this point, Series 9 had already started to air before this production came out. I'm not kidding, the first 10 episodes of Series 9 had already aired here in the UK before we even got the chance to see this. I looked to see if there was any kind of live broadcast event with this special, but nope, it was straight to home media after we already got part of Series 9. This means that they must have written, pre-planned, filmed, edited, and distributed both Calling All Engines and Series 9 at the exact same time, which would have been immediately after they just got done distributing Series 8 and rushing the US dub of Series 7. This is one of the most baffling production choices I've ever seen from the franchise that I don't really see anyone talk about. Did they feel like after Series 7 and 8 that a new series of Thomas and Friends had to be released every year no matter the cost? Despite the fact that we were already getting a feature length special? To me that just spells heavily rushed. Like guys, it's perfectly fine if there's a 2 or 3 year distance between series. The episodes are much longer than the classic era, they would require more time to look their best, and the kids can be entertained with reruns until you're ready. Breathe guys! Breathe. No wonder some crew members were supposedly concerned over the idea of a feature-length special working. They hardly had time to work on it in the first place. And so, because of that, again, without spoiling anything, what we're left with feels like a longer-than-normal episode of Series 8, with almost nothing to help it stand out. This was the best that people got in 2005, and it was basically slapped onto the shelves with nothing but a bunch of Series 8 episodes and songs. Yeah, what a way to celebrate, guys. A bunch of episodes from your failed rebrand and a feature-length special that's just a longer version of it. Okay, the Golden Thomas take-along toy does look cool, but that's about it. With all this crap just thrown at us, on top of everything else happening with the party, and Chris's petition, 
<sighs> yeah, it sounds like the 60th anniversary was a miserable time to be a Thomas fan. But enough about that mess, we're here to talk about the special itself. So, today I'll be going over the story, the characters and their contributions, the production design, and finally wrapping up with something that's a little bit different this time around, where I'll basically go over how I would have approached Calling All Engines if I was given the keys to it. So, ladies and gents, this is Calling All Engines. Today, Luke is reviewing Calling All Engines. Luke needs a drink to keep him awake during this mid-as-fuck special. He has a hot Vimto, a glass of water, and a can of Coke. Which of these will help keep Luke going in the review? Is it the hot Vimto? No! If Luke drinks this, he'll get drowsy and fall asleep, and the review will take another year to be made. Let's try again. What about the glass of water? Will this help him stay awake? No! If Luke drinks water, he'll move on to a healthy lifestyle, and he won't make YouTube videos anymore. Let's try one more time. What about the can of Coke? Yes! The caffeine will ruin his sleep patterns and keep him awake during the review. Well done. It's the summertime, and that can only mean one thing. Lots of holidaymakers travelling to the island of Sodor. The Fat Controller announces to the engines that a new airport is to be built in order to bring more passengers to the island than ever before. And you know what? I actually really like the concept. Yeah, I mean, for a feature-length special, it is kind of generic that the premise is just the very important thing being built for us trope, but I like that it's an airport. On a railway that operates solely from whoever visits on the mainland, they're opening the doors for people across the globe to come and visit. Times are changing, and they are adapting as they expand their reach across the ocean without relying on only boats. I like that. However, the conflict that comes from this story, and is the main focus of the special, is Diesels and Steamies having to work together when they really don't want to. Or as they like to call it, Steamies vs Diesels. This was technically a phrase that began with their Series 8 DVD released in 2004 with the same name in the US. But yeah, it's the beginning of the premise of the Diesels always trying to one-up the steam engines and vice versa. Something that does go as far back as Series 2 with the very first Diesels that were introduced, and is admittedly something that the show Post Magic Railroad has been struggling to be consistent with. See Salty's Secret, where Bill and Ben don't want help from Salty because he's a Diesel, but their friend Mavis is right there. I'm a new Diesel and I'm here to give you some help. Bill and Ben didn't think they needed any help, especially from a Diesel. Or Trusty Rusty, when Duncan regresses as a character and ignores Rusty's advice because he's a Diesel, when he's supposed to be friends with him by now. I wish all Diesels were like you. Let's be friends. Suits me, replied Rusty. We'll mend that bad bit of rail first thing tomorrow. Don't use the old wooden bridge, said Rusty. It's dangerous. How would you know? Whish, Duncan. You're only a diesel. Piss off! Or the entirety of Series 8, where diesels are mostly made out to be all nasty and devious while kind of disregarding the nice ones. Calling All Engines actually addresses those problems and looks to fix them. Rather than the Diesels sabotaging the steam engines, Thomas is the first one to sabotage the Diesels' work, both when he knocks Arian Burt's flatbed off the track, and when he gives the wrong train of trucks to Diesel for his job. The worst thing that they did was biff his and Percy's trucks and threw insults at them, which, while nasty, is pretty tame compared to what Thomas did. 
which ties into the end of the day when hardly any of the work has been accomplished and Tidmouth Sheds is knocked down, unable to be rebuilt. Proof that sometimes your heroes can stoop just as low, if not lower, than those who are made out to be your villains. Even though the Diesels do stoop to that same low when Diesel shunts a flatbed of paint all over Thomas, and then he and the rest of the Diesels join in on the shunting fights between them and the steam engines, you could argue that Thomas had it coming with what he did to them. They are both as bad as each other. Don't misunderstand me though, because as interesting as this stuff is in concept, the process of actually watching the story unfold is so boring. They mostly just throw the same stinky steamies and smelly diesels insults back and forth and back and forth over and over. And the accidents, even the ones caused by the shunting fight, do feel a bit tame and sometimes rather goofy. Like, wow, James gets shunted under a coal hopper. Oh no, Henry gets shunted under a leaking pipe. Diesel gets shunted into a shed and then off the tracks. Okay, that one was pretty good. Or Toby! Getting shunted onto the tipper's loading ramp. Help! cried Percy, I'm not a truck! But no one heard him. I'm very disappointed in you, Percy, he said. You know it's against the rules to go on the tipper's loading ramp. The moment they do come to realise their whole back and forth fighting with each other isn't working is when the Fat Controller announces that because of the Confusion and delay. Cheers, mate. The airport will be complete, and that means the engines will not have as much work to do, if any at all. Um, guys, you do know that passengers and goods from the mainland are still a thing, right? Yeah, the unfinished airports won't get you as many as you were hoping, but you'll still be busy until it is finished. This causes the steam engines to dream about what they think will happen to them if they don't have any work to do. But because this is a baby show and we can't dare mention scrap as it might imply death, even though they totally referenced that in the last series, their dreams are a bit... well I say a bit, I mean incredibly silly. James dreams he's a coconut shy, Gordon dreams he's a climbing frame, Edward dreams he's a scarecrow, and Percy dreams he's... a roller coaster. St stop! 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 <sighs> Now look, the series has done crazier and more childish shit that doesn't make sense for the sake of being so wacky and silly for the kids before. Hell, the last feature length production before Calling All Engines was all kinds of nonsensical mindfuckery. But this, the spectacle of a heavy steam engine rushing up and down a roller coaster, those big beady eyes stuck on Percy's face, and the JPEG of Percy being dragged up and down as goofy as possible. This was the celebration of 60 years of the Railway series. This was the justification for an entirely new rebrand. And this was in no way how I and I am sure many other people ever wanted to see this franchise. Even for a dream sequence, the other engine's dreams feel tame in comparison. This just feels... wrong. <sighs> so thanks to Thomas talking between the steam engines and the diesels, they all have a meeting where they finally decide to start working together. There's an accident with a water tower that breaks the runaway, which gets resolved in less than an episode's length. And the airport is finally open as the planes come in to land with steam engines and diesels realising the best way to get work done on time is to work together. I'm not kidding, the story feels like it wraps up that quickly, and considering how slow and dragged out the rest of it was, it's kind of a whiplash. Oh, and Tidmouth Sheds is rebuilt so Emily could stay with them. I'll talk about the characters in just a moment, but before I do, I want to talk about some things that I genuinely appreciated upon this rewatch, because, believe it or not, there are some good things here. As previously mentioned with Tidmouth Sheds being left in ruins, I like that it's Thomas who's responsible for an inconvenience towards both himself and his friends. Again, it shows our heroes can unintentionally cause more problems than fix them. It also leads into an admittedly very creative and funny sequence where the engines have to find other places to sleep, with some nice character pairings. Gordon sleeps under a tent, and to me, this is how you do goofy moments in Thomas. A big, magnificent express engine awkwardly sheltered under a tent is a grounded but still humorous visual. <laughs> I also like how they kind of give this a little arc. 
At first he feels undignified sleeping under it, then the tent is blown away in the storm, and at the end of the special when the sheds are fixed, Gordon is the only one who's cross because he actually liked where he was sleeping. I was just starting to like my tent, huffed Gordon. So someone dragged that huge tent back from wherever it was, and he actually started to appreciate it. <laughs> I don't know why I find that funny, but it just makes me chuckle. Speaking of the storm, it's the best part of the special. The sequence of a physical model set being demolished by wind and rain is so cool to see. The sound design of everything collapsing in the hallowing wind combined with the intensity of the score by Hartshorn is brilliant, and comes to a magnificent close with the collapsing of the Sodor Suspension Bridge. The Sodor Suspension Bridge twisted and shook in the gale. Then there was trouble. Absolutely fantastic, major well done to the film crew for this. And later on when Thomas mends that part of the bridge by lowering the suspension onto it, also fantastic. You feel the weight of this heavy slab of iron that has to be very carefully placed down, and Thomas's struggle to keep it steady feels genuine. You could say it leaves you <coughs> suspenseful. And finally, while it's not a main plot point and feels kind of backseated by everything else, I really like what they do with Tidmouth Sheds. They establish in the opening montage the importance of Tidmouth Sheds with how it's where the engines go to rest their wheels and talk about the day's events with each other. It's something that brings them together. So when the rebuild is postponed, it divides them as they go to find separate places to sleep. So never do they really ever confide in each other, and so they are more irritable with the Diesels, leading to the big fight. Only when Thomas brings them all together for the first time in days with the meeting at the coaling plant, do they finally see sense and start to cooperate with the Diesels. So when the airport is finally complete because of working together, their reward is their newly built Tidmouth Sheds. They are back as a unity again, with Emily now at their side. This is also more of a, you know, personal thing, but I love how they wrote Tidmouth Sheds being rebuilt into the plot itself, rather than just, you know, changing it on a whim. It reminds me of Sir Topham Hatt's Holiday back in Series 5, when Annie and Clarabelle's old worn-out props being changed into their fresh new ones was written into the episode's plot. Thomas and Friends massively appeals to children and adults with autism, and while I don't want to give in to the stereotype that people with autism can't deal with change very well, it is something that we struggle with. Change is inevitable, so it's important to make your audience as comfortable with the change as possible when it happens, especially when it's kids. They could have just replaced the sheds out of nowhere and just expected people to accept it, but they didn't. They looked out for their audiences and wrote in a change that felt completely natural to deal with. I don't know if that detail was from Paul Larson or the script executive Sam Barlow, but I heavily respect that decision. The plot of this special may have been boring, weird and wasted potential in many areas, but it's nice to know that there was some creativity and intelligent moments sprinkled here and there. Luke's videos are full of all sorts of background music. Can you help Luke choose a song for his review? He has Star Wars Cantina Band Music, a lo-fi remix of the same song, and Smudger laughing on a loop. What sound should Luke choose? Should he pick the Cantina Bar music? No. Luke can't use official Star Wars music or else he'll get a copyright strike. Let's try again. What about Smudger laughing on a loop? Should he pick that? No, that's not an actual song. And will get on audience's nerves. <laughs> Let's try one more time. How about the lo-fi remix of Cantina Bar? Yes, that makes for perfect background music, as long as we credit the remix artist. Thank you, Closed on Sunday, and well done you.
You may have noticed that I neglected to mention two specific characters in that plot summary. Those characters being the Magic Railroad stars Lady and Diesel 10. I guess Splatter and Dodge must have been made redundant and so went to a pub to hang out with Boko Duke and the Series 5 rejects. Oh no, oh no wait, there's Derek! Hey bud, did you get your engine sorted? If not, then the poor bastard is probably going to have an asthma attack when he gets to the top of that hill. Sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, the Magic Railroad characters. With the research I've done, uh, I basically just read the wiki, the decision to include these two was apparently because they were successful in merchandise sales. Which, to their credit, was a smart move, as they were probably the most memorable parts of the film, Diesel 10 more so than Lady. And it was also good of them to separate the special from Magic Railroad's continuity, given its rather poor reception. But I'll be honest, Diesel 10 feels like a pointless addition to Calling All Engines. He just lifts things into trucks with his claw while Thomas just tries to keep away from him. Until the finale when Thomas needs to ask him for help with clearing the tracks so they can fix the runway. I do like that they build up the menace of Diesel 10 before Thomas has to be brave and talk to him when he really needs help. And I also like this special's take on Diesel 10 where instead of being his comically bombastic villain persona in Magic Railroad, he fits more into this era of the show by being grumpy and scary, but not villainous. However, you could remove him from the story and he adds almost nothing. He does kind of fit the story with how both steam engines and diesels are impressed with Thomas having the balls to work with Diesel 10, but not by much. Just replace him at the end with the breakdown crane and while you do miss out on him being, you know, included in the special, to me, nothing really changes. Though at the very least his presence in the film doesn't leave me as conflicted as I do towards a lady. When the engines all have their dreams about what might happen to them if they don't have any work to do, Thomas's dream shows him going up into the mountains shrouded in fog as the sun sets, and at the peak of the mountain, he finds Lady. No longer is she the godlike being from another dimension powered by arts and crafts glitter, now she's a special engine who works high in the hills. Oh, and Series 4 Rusty is there too, that's neat. As nice as it is to include Lady in this special, and her working with Rusty gives Thomas the realisation that steam engines and diesels do their best when they work together, I feel like this special is lacking in any explanation as to how she works in this era. Like, she's not a figment of Thomas's imagination because she's set to work in the mountains outside of Thomas's dream. Do we ever see those mountains? Are they too far away or too difficult for the other engines to reach them? If so, how does Thomas know what they look like, and how does Rusty make it up there? It just leaves me feeling confused towards Lady's inclusion in the film. She's better than how she's handled in Magic Railroad as her being a sentient engine actually has a purpose this time, but her presence leaves a few… Uh, unanswered questions. As for our regular main characters, to bring up Thomas again, I like how he's written in this special. It's his fault with the delay towards Tidmouth Sheds being rebuilt and other jobs around the island, and he tries to make up for that by working his hardest after the storm hits to get the island back into working order. But he still can't get along with the Diesels, which leads to Diesel making a fool of Thomas with the paint truck, and so he kicks off the scuffle amongst the rest of the engines. Only when the Fat Controller shares the severity of the delays does Thomas realise that he and the Diesels need to find some common ground. He organises the meeting that momentarily lets the engines work together without fuss, and after the whole water tower incident, does the bravest thing he's ever done and talks to the big scary diesel with the crusher claw. While it is a tad predictable, he does genuinely feel like a different character at the end of the special than when he started. As for the rest of the characters, they don't really have that many notable standout moments as Thomas is the main focus. Which for a special that really emphasised the whole working as a team thing, many of the characters do feel notably sidelined. Saying that though, I really like what they did with the Diesels in this special. Diesel, Ari and Bert, while they are the nasty brutes they were from the previous series, you do kind of sympathise with them being made out as the bad guys when their incident with the Sheds was, again, Thomas's fault. Ari and Bert in particular get the most screen time that they have ever gotten up to this point. The shot in the learning segment where they help Gordon with the express up Gordon's hill is actually rather unique and cool to see. I also really like what they did with Mavis, 
as Thomas goes to her to ask for help with bringing the diesels to meet with the steam engines. Mavis, the one who started off years ago as self-centred and childish as the other diesels, is now a kind friend happy to help Thomas in bringing the engines together to resolve their conflict. It's subtle, but it's wholesome, all things considered. What isn't very wholesome, however, is the return of the bitch from Series 8 that we all know and tolerated. Emily. Be quiet and go to sleep, Emily huffed. <sighs> it was bad enough that her character was changed from Series 7 going into Series 8, but she's amped up to such an unlikable degree here that it almost makes me wonder what the point of including her in the story was in the first place. Thomas goes to sleep in her sheds while Tidmouth is out of order. He shares his worries over everything that's going on, and rather than being a friend and listening to him express his concerns, she just tells him to fuck off and go to sleep. Sure, maybe you can argue she doesn't want her personal space being invaded, but she's still Thomas's friend. Even later on when the Fat Controller says Tidworth Sheds will only be fixed if the airport is finished, what's the first thing she says? And now you will never move out of my shed, huffed Emily. <laughs> How the fuck are we supposed to like her? Even when Thomas spends the night in a siding because he's too tired to travel all the way home, that owl in the tree next to Thomas may as well be better company. I see what they were going for with adding an extra berth to the sheds for her to join the rest of the engines of the main cast, without being so crammed into a shed only meant for six engines, but come on Hit, at least make us give a shit about her. Maybe next time don't have her bully the main protagonist who kids are going to relate to the most when he's being vulnerable? So all in all, the characters in this special are… a mixed bag. From important to almost insignificant, from in character to out of character, they are incredibly middle of the road. Middle of the track? Never mind, moving on. Luke needs to post on Twitter to promote his YouTube channel. He has a hot take his personal address, and a meme. What should Luke post? Should he post a hot take? No. Hot takes will make him lose followers and subscribers. Let's try again. What about his personal address? Should Luke post that? No, otherwise he'll dox himself, and everyone will know where he lives. Let's try one more time. How about a meme? Yes! Memes make Luke speak the language of millennials and young adults, so they will want to check out his channel for more. Well done! Weirdly, there's not that much to talk about with the set design and music. Despite its longer than normal runtime and the presence of Lady and Diesel 10, Calling All Engines feels almost identical to the look and sound of Series 8. Same decent but kind of forgettable music, to even some of the same shots being used as stock footage from the previous series just to hammer it in how similar they are. To a point where they played the exact same intro and the Welcome to the Island of Sodor segment, with the only difference being a bigger than normal title font. Good, good job. There are some set designs in this special that I like, but only some. This shot of the little bridge going across the river is very pretty. The mountain tracks in Thomas's dream are very whimsical and admittedly quite stunning. And the suspension bridge is really cool, and probably one of the only sets that takes full advantage of that wide screen. It must have also been one of the production team's favourite sets to be used, as this bridge would continue to appear throughout the rest of the era, and even into the CGI series. Yeah, this was the first hit era production to attempt world building with its brand new set locations. The Sodor Airport, the Suspension Bridge, and the rebuilt Tidmouth Sheds all appear consistently throughout the rest of the series. The airport is abandoned in the switch to CGI, which in retrospect kind of takes away its importance here, 
but the choice to feature it in the rest of the series following Calling All Engines was nice. What's interesting about this special is that because it was released on DVD, it's the only Thomas special to my knowledge to feature deleted scenes. Most of them are pointless fluff, but one scene that's part of showing the damage of the storm to the audience shows the windmill from the opening sequence completely destroyed. To repeat something said by ThomasFan261 in his review of this special, I think including the windmill in the final cut of this film would have really shown how dire the situation is and hit the audience's emotions hard. This is the windmill we've seen since the beginning of the series. Hell, when Thomas first debuted on British television and the intro began, this was the very first thing we saw as part of the show. There was always a sense of untouchable status with the windmill, like it was always there and could stand the test of time no matter what. So if the windmill had been destroyed, this would have really told the audience that the island has been well and truly messed up. I know why they showed her the suspension bridge instead, because we just saw it collapse in the night and we need to see the aftermath, but this would have been so much better to me. There is also songs featured in the special that play during montages of the engines working, and you know what? I actually really like some of them this time. Though I am always going to hate the engine roll call song, even with the needlessly changed lyrics to fit the special, Ed Welch really stepped up his game from last time. Busy is goofy, but still kinda funny to see the engines running around trying to get jobs done on time. Though the sped up footage reminds me a little too much of Mad Max Fury Road. Trying to do things better is catchy and fills its purpose, showing the differences between steam engines and diesels. And Together is actually a really good ending song that's nicely sung and really shows how much the engines have accomplished working together. But that's not all, isn't it? There's something that I've neglected to talk about throughout this review. Something that completely tanks the reputation of this film. <sighs> well, no point dancing around it any longer. Golden Mount of Shit Award for the worst part about Calling All Engines is without a doubt, the learning segments. It's not even a contest. The Magic Railroad had way more low points in what it tried to do, but these? These are worse. These are actually worse. In a fashion very similar to how the Series 8 episodes were broadcasted on TV, every so often the plot is broken up by learning segments ones that are either filmed with the model engines and layouts, or CGI animation segments. Still not sure who animated these. If you saw my Series 8 review, you will know that these are the most childish, basic, drawn-out segments made to only challenge people whose IQ begins with a zero and a decimal point. I didn't mind them so much last time because they were skippable. I only had to talk about them for a minute, and because it was optional for me to watch them but these are related to the main plot and are connected to the story beats, such as making Diesel take the wrong train or finding Mavis. In a special that is already kind of boring as nothing more than a stretched out episode of the show, these segments drag the pacing of Calling All Engines to a screeching halt and serve no other purpose than to pad out the runtime. Hell, the DVD extras include two more learning segments that were cut from the final release because of the runtime. Hey, there's gonna be more? Sometimes they even repeat stuff we'll already find out, like the segment that shows the differences between steam engines and diesels, before they play a song about the differences between steam engines and diesels. And sometimes they make the engines out to be complete idiots, like Diesel being completely unaware that he's pulling trucks of bananas. Which, by the way, how would the kids feel if their decisions are what led Thomas to giving Diesel the wrong train, which leads to Tidmouth Sheds being left demolished? And when they arrived at Tidmouth Sheds, they discovered that they had been knocked down. And bananas are no good for building sheds, the Fat Controller added. You did this, children! This is your fault! 
I feel bad for Mark Seal who had to write these because I'm sure he was just doing what the producers asked him to do. And if these were optional and just included as a bonus feature on the DVD release, I am certain I would have almost no problem with them. But they are not, and it sucks so much enjoyment out of this special. If these had to be included as part of the special, like they were an absolute necessity to the production for whatever reason, is there a way to include them without tanking the pace of the film? Why yes, there is, and the answer can be found with... The Magic Roundabout movie from 2005. Bear with me on this. Now I haven't watched this film in years, but there is one thing included on the DVD that I have fond memories of, and that is the Magic Mysteries quiz game. The premise being that you would watch the film normally, but at random moments, the film would stop and ask you questions related to the characters, story beats, and lines spoken. Not only were there two difficulty options to choose from, but just to let it sink in one more time, it was an option. Meaning up to you on whether or not you wanted your film to be stopped by these questions. You could watch the film normally without any interruptions beginning to end, and then choose to test your knowledge by watching it again with questions. Or you could maybe make it your first watching experience, and if you don't like being interrupted, you could just go to the menu and turn it off. Wouldn't that have been a better option for calling all engines? Questions based on the differences of steam engines and diesels? Plot points of the special, and mayhaps even the lyrics to the songs? In the end, what we are stuck with is babyfied padding to bring calling all engines up to feature length, which insults your intelligence more than it educates. What could have been a small bonus on the DVD became a brain-dead, dragged-out, needlessly incorporated part of an already dull special. For the 60th anniversary celebration, Calling All Engines just exists, and is overall a very bland, disappointing, middle-of-the-road feature-length special. It's not the worst thing the franchise has ever produced, and upon revisiting this for the first time in years, there were genuine moments of quality I was able to appreciate. Some characters feel very in-character, the subtle bits of humour are nice, certain set pieces are very pretty to look at, and I really like the concept. But the boring execution of the dragged out story, the treatment of certain characters, the fact that the production design has next to nothing to make it feel special, and those godforsaken learning segments hold it really far back. I'd honestly rather watch The Magic Railroad, because while that film had some incredibly baffling choices with the magic elements and the stuff with the human characters, the parts that did feel in line with the classic series were incredible. Calling All Engines in no way feels like Classic Thomas, and therefore nothing like the book series it's meant to be celebrating. It could have done worse, but it also could have done a hell of a lot better. Speaking of which, one thing I'd like to present to you all now is my own take on Calling All Engines. If Hit Entertainment gave me the keys to the show in 2004, how would I have written a feature-length special to commemorate 60 years of Thomas the Tank Engine? Well, I would have been four around that time, so probably nothing that makes sense. But if I was given the chance to write it with the knowledge I have now, what would I do? Allow me to show you. Firstly, do you remember my plan to alter the production cycle of Series 6 and 7 that I explained in my Series 7 review? In short, my idea was that the US dub of Series 6 would come out in 2003, whilst Series 7 gets pushed back to 2004 so as not to rush any of its production after the Jack and the Pack spin-off was cancelled. For 2005, not only do we get a proper US dub of Series 7 that isn't rushed, but this is the year HIT makes their big start in producing the first model production entirely under their ownership. For this pitch, instead of Series 8, imagine Calling All Engines is the first production to mark the beginning of a brand new era. Very similar to how Hero of the Rails marked the beginning of the CGI era. It's a fresh new start, and only one project to focus on means enough time and money to make it the best it can be and really stand out on its own. Get comfortable and grab a drink, ladies and gents. This is Calling All Engines. Fight me! <laughs> Less people are travelling to Sodor in the summer. While passenger services continue on as usual, they don't see as many holidaymakers as they'd hoped for. It's clear that the island of Sodor is not very accessible to different countries, as they would either have to travel by ferries or to England first, which are both very expensive. The engines frequently discuss this with each other at Tidmouth Sheds. 
as well as mention how the sheds themselves are starting to look and feel a bit… dreary. It's also made clear that the sheds have been around for a very long time and are starting to fall apart, but before they can discuss this any further, the Fat Controller arrives. He understands that the island is in need of a big change, and he announces that he will be opening the island's very first airport. This excites the engines as they have never seen huge planes carrying people before. Two engines are chosen to help with the construction, which are Thomas and James. So hear me out on this, I figured not only would I make this a Thomas story because, well, he's the title character so he has to be there, but it's also going to be a James story. You'll see why in a bit. So he and Thomas are put in charge of delivering supplies to the airport, and shunting them where they need to be during the building. To their annoyance however, they are assigned to work with Diesel, Ari and Bert. Similar to the original special, they throw insults at the engines, which makes them want to pay them back. So they start to sabotage their work. Only no banana trucks this time, we're more dignified than that. One of their tricks goes too far however, as James convinces the trucks to bump Diesel when they reach Gordon's Hill. The trucks do so and Diesel becomes a runaway, and to make things worse, he ends up in the main yards and crashes straight into Tidmouth's sheds. The sheds were already established to be old and worn out, and this is the final straw as Diesel hits a support beam and the whole place collapses. Everyone blames Diesel and James knows it's his fault, but he doesn't want to admit it out loud in case he gets found out. The engines all go to find somewhere else to sleep as per the original special, and Thomas goes to Emily's shed. He starts ranting about the accident and how stupid Diesel's are, unaware that James is the culprit. Emily, being the motherly figure she is from series 7, simply listens and decides not to challenge his Diesel prejudice as it has been a long day for him. That night, the storm happens, same as before, and leaves the island in such a horrible state. The emotional kick in the heart for Thomas and the audience watching is seeing the completely destroyed windmill. Because of this, the Fat Controller assigns the other engines to do jobs on top of their usual work to get the railway fixed and the airport built in time. This begins to tire the engines out, and not helping is their lack of energy from having to sleep in different places, making them more and more irritable. Which I think could lead to some funny and witty banter as they grumble and snap at each other. But none are as irritable as James. I figured that this special could mark the time that we tackle James's diesel prejudice that we saw in Christopher Audrey's book, James and the Diesel Engines. We already had Diesel crash against the sheds in a style very similar to the snobby one-off Diesel in Old Stuck Up, and maybe you get the engines trying to convince James to just get over it, such as with Henry's line from the beginning of Crossed Lines. They're all right, said Henry, just mixed traffic engines like you and me. Mixed up engines, you mean, James grunted. I also think it's kind of fitting to make James one of the main stars of the 60th anniversary special. Thomas makes the most sense, of course, as his book is the most popular of the Railway series, but it also makes sense for James, as his first appearance in the books was also in Thomas's book, when he first arrived on Sodor and had his nasty accident. He's a popular character, why not make him the focus of a celebration of the series? So James goes about his work, but Ari and Bert give him grief and make him a middle engine, just as they did in series 6. I think that'd be a nice callback, only this time, you know, it's… not stupid. This makes him late at his next job, and he complains about it to Thomas at the airport. Thomas decides it's his turn to step in, and so asks James to cover his shunting at the airport, while he sets off to the yards with the intention to trick the diesels. He sees Ari and Bert about to leave with a heavy train together, and his idea to trick them flies into his funnel. In a callback to his very first book, he comes up behind them as quietly as he can and blows his whistle very loudly. The two diesels are surprised and surge forward into their train. A van breaks open and a ton of supplies for mending the railway spill out onto the track. Unlike James's trick, there's no way Thomas can hide from this, and he is rightfully reprimanded by the Fat Controller in front of everyone. The Fat Controller announces to everyone that because of these constant delays and accidents, the airport will not be finished on time, which makes everyone sad and frustrated. The last job of the day is given to James, who has to take the remains of Tidmouth Shed's roof to the scrapyards. On his journey, he thinks about all that's happened over the past few days and what it's led to with the airport being unfinished. Then as night falls, he arrives at the scrapyards. 
the mist has rolled in and the place suddenly feels very unnerving as he puffs slowly past the piles of rusty iron and scrapped engines. He shunts his trucks into a siding and suddenly hears a crushing sound from the smelting shed. He looks inside and sees the silhouette of a claw in the flashing sparks. Shaken to his smoke box, he races out of the yards as fast as he can, with the last thing we see being the mysterious shadow of a diesel hidden in the smoke, watching him run away. James gets back to his spot for the night, and with no one to talk to, he begins to fear the worst of what would happen if there is no work for him and the other engines to do. What if the fat controller scraps us? He thinks to himself. Meanwhile, Thomas is being told off by Emily for his trick on Arian Burt. Thomas argues back by talking about the mean things the Diesels have done to him and James, before Emily finally draws a line in the sand with Thomas's prejudice, and tells him straight that he and James are just as bad as them for causing accidents and tiring out their friends when they are already trying to mend the storm damage. This is the moment where Thomas finally realises how much of an idiot he's been and that he needs to put things right. But how can he get James and the Diesels to get along with each other? Emily suggests getting them together for a meeting so he can convince them to set aside their differences, which is a great idea to Thomas. So the next morning, he rushes off to find Mavis and asks her to bring the Diesels together at the coaling plant like he does in the original special, while also telling James to do the same. The same thing happens with him being too tired to go home after rushing about, so he sleeps somewhere else for the night, and we get the same scene with Emily missing having someone to talk to, only now she's actually sympathetic. The next day, the meeting happens. Thomas apologises to Ari and Bert for causing their accident, and explains to them the same thing he said to the rest of the engines in the special. The importance of the airport, and the effects that having hardly any passengers will have on them. The Diesels begrudgingly agree, but are still not very keen on working with James. And while James is more willing to work with them, it's more out of fear of being scrapped after his fears were started last night. So they all begin working together and thanks to their cooperations, the storm damage is finally all cleaned up and the airport nears completion in just about a week. Impressing both the Fat Controller and the other engines, things are starting to look up. Then, James has to shunt one last train of building materials, but the points are faulty, causing his flatbed to travel between the tracks crossed line style. He stops, but the sudden jerk breaks a coupling, and the rest of his train derails, smashing into a water tower, and it crashes onto the runway, breaking it in the process. The Diesels start blaming James, which Thomas then argues back, and in a moment of anger, forgets his working together mindset, and says, Trust a Diesel who wrecked the engine sheds to know all about accidents. At this moment, James finally speaks up and admits to his trick on Diesel. He says that if he had just admitted to being in the wrong, the airport would have been finished a lot sooner, and the arguing wouldn't have gone this far. At this moment, everyone is cross with James, and now it seems like nothing can be done to clear the tracks, so an engine can get George the Steamroller to come and fix the runway. But to James, there is one option, and before they can ask him, he rushes off down the line. He knows there's only one engine who can help them at this moment, but he has to be brave. James arrives at the scrapyards and stops outside the smelting shed. He takes a deep breath and boldly heads inside. The hellish glow is all around him and the fizzing sparks keep him on edge. He sees the silhouette of the claw again and calls out, Excuse me! The loud growling of an engine is heard and the silhouette begins to move. Out of the smoke emerges the scrapyard diesel who all the engines fear to talk to, Diesel 10. James bravely says hello as the big man himself rolls out of the smoke with his claw held high, looking grumpy to see him as James tries to convince him to help out, to no avail. But then, in his most vulnerable moment, James admits to his horrible behaviour towards Diesels and how he wants to set things right. That Diesels are just as important as steam engines, and he wishes he had seen that sooner. And after being grumpy and scary throughout most of their conversation, Diesel 10 lowers his claw and smiles, saying he'll help. In James's proudest moment, he leads Diesel 10 to the part of the track that's been blocked. The engines watch in amazement as James arrives with Diesel 10 behind him. Even the Diesels are impressed. As Diesel 10 starts to clear the wreckage, they all join in with moving the trucks of debris out of the way. 
The tracks are cleared, which allows James to bring George the Steamroller to the airport. The runway is fixed just in time as the first plane arrives to the airport. The engines watch in amazement as this is their first time seeing such a huge jet plane as it lands safely on the runway. Amidst the celebrations, Diesel 10 has to get back to the scrapyards. He suggests to James to talk to the Diesels. James looks to Ari Burton Diesel, apologises for his nasty behaviour and looks to wipe the slate clean. The Diesels apologise for their bad behaviour and are happy to agree. The day ends with the steam engines returning to the newly built Tidmouth sheds. Emily notices the extra space and Thomas tells her that he put in a good word with the Fat Controller, that it's his way of saying thank you for helping him see sense and for putting up with his constant complaining. Emily is very grateful for this, and everyone goes into their berths except James. He's ready to go back to his spot at the coaling plant, thinking nobody would want him in the sheds. But his friends have forgiven him for his mistakes, and welcome him into the sheds with open arms. All seven of them are now back together as a unity, and none are happier than Thomas and James. Not only in a new shed, but with a whole new outlook on Diesel's. A truly wholesome moment to conclude on, with a story that now, hopefully, feels more like a tried and true celebration to both the TV series and the 60th anniversary of the Railway series. All the engines are on hand, waiting for a plane to land, be the diesels, be the steam, they all keep working as a team, and we will now go to bed with all the rest that and no one can remember when steamers work with diesel tan. They're two, they're four, they're six, they're eight. The shunting trucks and hauling freight. Red and green and brown and blue. They're the really useful crew. And all with different roles to play around Tidmouth sheds or far away. Down the hills and round the bends. Thomas and his friends. We go Daisy was in there.